and welcome to everyone. You're, welcome. You're into another Word Up Bible study. And this exciting study, uh, this is part three. Yeah, this is part three. Um, and we're looking at power. What, what got me to start this series was a lot of believers go around talking about power. Talking about we have power as believers and God gave us power. But I was watching so many people have power shortages. I was watching so many people get into situations where they did not have the strength, they did not have um, the ability, they did not have the fortitude to handle what was going on. And yet, God said, we do. Come on, you better listen to me. I started this because how do you really know you have power when you get into your situations? And I will tell you, you're going to need power to survive the rest of this day, maybe tomorrow. I don't know what's going on. But I want to show you where our power comes from so you can actually get a hold of that power when you need it. you got to be able to know that there is no, no, no tricks to this. It is strictly based on the power of the Holy Spirit, which we're talking about, God the Holy Spirit. But it's also accessible to every believer. So... I'm talking about power for anything you need. God knew, before we even got saved, God knew that you were going to go through the situation you're in right now. He knew you were going to go through some other situations down the road. And you know what God did? He gave you enough power that you can handle it. The problem is, believers don't know how to access this power. Let's go to Acts chapter 3 with me. While you're turning to Acts chapter 3, get your devices out, whatever you have. Let me just say this to you. We're talking about God, the Holy Spirit that lives in you and why you have the power. Now, remember, we, we specialize in talking about God. We specialize in talking about Jesus. But God said God, the Holy Spirit, would be living in you. Acts chapter 3. I want you to go with me as we read this text. Acts chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. I want to show you. Well, God said, we have the power. You have the power. I don't know what it is going on, but you have the power right now, not only to survive it, but to be victorious over this. I'm not one of those uh, teachers who try to exaggerate stuff. I'm telling you what I have seen God do. Somebody better agree with me. You need to tell yourself right now, if you're watching, I have the power, power to handle this. I don't know what it is. But tell yourself, I have the power to handle this. Because God is saying that he placed the power in us. Name of this lesson is, where does the power come from? It's focused on the power of the Holy, God the Holy Spirit gives us. And it's focused on how you can access that power. I'll say it again. Where does the power come from? God the Holy Spirit. We now have to know how to access that power that we have. Acts chapter 3. I'm reading from the King James Version. Starting in verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, was laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Are you with me? To ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So we know a blind man was being set down in front of the temple to beg for gifts, alms, to beg for whatever he could get a hold of. That's the only way. As a matter of fact, the Jewish culture made this way available to those who were crippled or blind or whatever their fate may be. They had special allowances for them to sit and beg. And then there was a lot of Jewish ordinances and laws about taking care of the poor. So this man, all he could do was be laid, yet be carried and laid in front of the temple and beg for alms. And then he entered in, verse 3, who seeing Peter and John, what he always does, asked them for alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive some money or something, food, expecting to receive something that was natural to give to someone in his condition. But Peter said, verse 6, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. 
Several things are happening in that sixth verse. The first thing is I'm just solidifying to you tonight as I go through this teaching that you have the power. Then we're going to talk about you got to know you have it. And then I'm going to share with you where it comes from. Then I'm going to share with you how to access it. So in this text, Peter and John said, we don't have any silver. We don't have any gold. But such as I have. What did they have? They had the, they had the power of God the Holy Spirit within them. And they spoke forth words and healing came forward. They said, uh, such as I have, I give to thee. The next words were, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Why in the name of Jesus of Nazareth? Because God does everything decent and in order. The Bible said, when Jesus said, I'm going to go away, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, I'm going to bring the Holy Spirit. He also said, the Holy Spirit would testify of me. Because what God does, he places things in the proper order, and we have to use them properly by studying his word and make sure. So when we speak forth healing, God, the Holy Spirit is holding us up. He's blessing us. He's empowering us. But then we have to now tap into what, what God said, God the Father, would happen to Jesus Christ. What did he say? You've been given a name that's above every name. Every knee must bow. Every tongue must confess. That Jesus is Lord. Things in heaven, things under the earth, things in the earth. All of them must bow their knee. So the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ, who is God, are all one. They work in harmony. They make sure that we can do the things we do. So Peter, believing that he had the power, that's the first step, guys. Believe you have the power. You don't need another preacher. You don't need nobody else to be with you. It's good when you can touch and agree. But if you don't understand you have the power, it won't do you any good in your personal situations. How many of us know? You can't tell everybody your stuff. You can't tell everybody what you're going through. As a matter of fact, they'll put words in your situation that can hinder your situation. Did you hear me? He said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. If you let anybody speak into your situation, while you're believing for power, they're speaking negative words or speaking words that keep you where you are. And if you just give in a little bit, you can allow those words to counteract what you already believe and what you pray for. What am I saying? I'm saying that be careful who you tell what you're going through. And I said... Make sure you realize you really don't have to tell anybody. If the Holy Spirit convicts you to touch and agree with me, the Bible says touching and agreeing is more power. But remember, you have enough power to get done what you need to get done. And if the Holy Spirit tells you to touch and agree or talk to someone else or grab someone else's hand because there's power, he will tell you whose hands to grab. That's how powerful the Holy Spirit is. He directs all of the parts of our lives. If not, guys, we would not have survived. There's many, many, many times the Holy Spirit is working on our behalf, empowering us, and we don't even know he's doing it. So Peter and John did everything that I want you to know that you need to do. All right? I have the power. The power needed in this situation was to, uh, God said, heal this lame man that was laid before the gate. And he said, he didn't just say, well, I'm doing it in the name of Peter. No, he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That's how you access the power. Once you said those words, rise up and walk, Jesus, who is sitting at the right hand on the throne of God, he's not the one that empowers you now. It's God, the Holy Spirit, who was left here as our comforter, as the spirit of truth, at the Bind the spirit of error as the spirit of power. It's the Holy Spirit that said, I'm glad you spoke those words in the name of Jesus. I understand that. So now he said, I'm going to move out and do what I need to do to make sure you understand. This text tells us we have the power that we need in order to survive. And I want you to know as we talk about it. Here is the sequence of power in your life. So you understand where the power comes from and how to access it. First, we talked about the triune God. And somebody, I need somebody to know, I'm, I'm doing a review. I, I think uh, um, somebody watched last week and thought this was a rerun. This is a brand new teaching. It's not a rerun because you're going to need this power. It is timely. It is for you now. And you're going to go through a situation that is going to be so tough that you will be derelict in your ability 
as a believer if you don't understand how to tap into the power. Listen to me. Leave this planet Earth and understand who you are. Our citizenship is in heaven. When you get to the place where you need power, it can't be you asking for the power. It's got to be that part of you that know God is in you that has to speak forth the power. So when I'm speaking, I'm not speaking just as James Duncan's. I'm speaking now as James Duncan, who is a child of God, who is a believer, who's been chosen by God, led into the family, and I have a right to speak this. Oh, we're going to talk about this. So watch this. The triune God's plan, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God had a plan. Uh, I always tell people it's really ridiculous that there were only two people on the earth, and they messed up. So the reality is we're always going to need God's power. So what God did, God sent his son Jesus, or Jesus came down, make me a body. You know the story. Jesus came and he lived among us, became like us, understood sin, resisted sin, lived through stuff without sinning. And then he fulfilled the plan of redemption by redeeming us. By dying for our sins. There was, I don't have time to talk about this because you know it. There was no other plan that could take sin out of our life if Jesus hadn't sacrificed and died. If you understand what we're saying, God the Father created us. We messed up. Then God the Father loved us so much. He said, even though you messed up, I'm going to bring you back. He said, well, you guys mess up a whole lot. So what I'm going to have to do is leave some power here so that every time you mess up, I'll bring you back. And the only way I can do that is to, is to come down as God, drink myself in flesh, Take on your sins because my justice demands that he that's the soul that sinned is going to die. So what I got to do is take on your sins so now you are considered sinless when you come into my kingdom. And as you sanctify yourself, you will begin to sin less. But it's got to be up to you. So understand, we're talking about where the power comes from. You have power. This is what he said. Jesus said, I'm redeeming you. He came down, taught us about the kingdom of God. Taught us how to touch and agree. Taught us the, you know, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, our Father, which are in heaven, how be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He gave us all of these, these access words into God's presence. He gave us scriptures that will let us know we can access the, the power. When you think about Psalms 23, he maketh me to lie down in green pasture. He leadeth me beside still water. I'm not the only one that knows there's times in my life when I need, Lord knows, I need some still water, which is symbolic of I need a place of peace today. One thing, if you agree with me, let's put it in the chat. One thing after another thing after another thing keeps piling up in my life. And so I realize now that God's power, his, I would call it a prophetic sequence, his divine sequence, means that even when I don't know I have power, it can't stop the power of God. God, Father, God, Son, God, Holy Spirit, God, so we got to say, man, Jesus came down, make me a body. Then he died on the cross. But he met with his disciples, John chapter 14 through 17, and said, look, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Then he left. He said, I'm going to send you a divine source of power. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. That's what we get to where, and I'm, I'm going to do this. No, this is not elementary. Some people don't really understand what God means by the power. you got to know what power to access and what the power is. So when Jesus ascended on high, right, he told his disciples to wait for the power, and you shall receive Dundia. Power, once the Holy Ghost has come on you, that's in you, and you'll be my witnesses. Now understand, the key part of this text is power and witnesses. Understand. I am so far from really understanding the power if I don't understand my the command from God to witness. The command from God to witness is power in itself. What are you talking about, Pastor? You know what I mean? The demand from God says I can be a witness. A witness to what? God, God's miraculous healing. God's keeping power. I want people to look and say, yeah, I've been through some storms. And Anybody know what I'm saying? I've been through some situations uh, where I held on in the darkness until morning came. And then somehow, supernaturally, when morning came, I found out I was still here. Oh, somebody ought to shout right there. Because God said, I, God, am holding on so I can be your witness. When folk look at you, they ought to see you as a witness for the Lord. Meaning that 
wow, if they can get through that, look what they escape. Look how happy they are. When they know you are a witness for God, God says the more you witness, the more power comes. A lot of people want to walk in the power, but you don't understand the conditions of the power. Teach, Pastor. You don't understand that you can't have power if you're not a witness because being a witness takes sanctification. It takes walking with God every day. It takes believing in God. It means putting God first. It means understanding the word of God. I can't witness that I don't know. That's what witness means. Witness means I can testify to something. Is there anybody out there can testify God is a healer? Anybody out there can testify God will keep you in a, a devastating situation? Anybody out there testify that God can restore stuff that was taken from you? Is there anybody to say, I'm a witness that God can keep me even when I don't have the finances to be kept? That's what I'm saying. So you've got to understand, when Jesus met, he said, you shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost come upon you, you shall be my witnesses. But you got to understand there's several Greek words for power. And so when we understand what type of power, we'll understand the force of the power we're using. In this text, uh, when it says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is upon you, it's talking about authority, exousia. Write that down, exousia, authority, man that's power. Authority means, uh, you know, and we use the example of a police officer, or I'll use a different example. Um, when uh, I retired from uh, school district, I was an officer in the main uh, office building where all of the, the Board of Education, where all of the leadership took place. I could walk into that building, go to my office, I could call people in. I was HR, so I had the ability to hire I was the one that did the firing. I was the one that brought people in for their reviews and I did salaries. Because of my name, because of who I was, because of my credential, I had the ability to hire and fire. The ability means I had the authority. It's my exousia. So the reason I say you have the power is because if God said without the authority, you can't do it. What am I saying? If I go to that same Board of Education building now that I've been retired from, first of all, I gotta walk through security, I gotta ask for somebody, I gotta be let in the building, I don't have keys to anything, I gotta wait until I get an appointment, I don't have the authority. But before I could walk in, go to the superintendent, to the superintendent, whatever I had to do. You have the authority now. Don't let the devil fool you. Don't let your circumstances fool you. Don't let your flesh fool you. You know, our flesh will try to make us believe nothing's happening. But it's just like when you're, you're, you're getting ready to hammer something in. First time you hit that nail, maybe it doesn't move. You can't see it moving and you got to hit it hard and hard. But you got to believe that the nail's going to do nothing if I stop hitting it. What am I saying? You have the authority. Don't let the enemy fool you because you don't see anything happening. That is not working. Keep speaking forth that authority. You will find, oh man, this is so good. You will find a situation turn around by you speaking it. And the, the turn around of that situation will be so divinely led that I'll be going on about my business. And I'll turn back around and see that that situation was taken care of. But I'll never see it if I don't believe I have the authority. The authority is the same thing as I have the right. Can I tell you, you have the right to whatever you're asking for. I'll put it in this terms. I even have the right to repent. Do you know, everybody in authority is not letting people come to them and repent. God said one of the rights Jesus Christ died for is so I can repent, clear up the communication between me and him so that I can continue walking in my power. Ooh, there's somebody out there now. The only problem is you got to clear up that communication and you got to use your authority, override your mind, override your flesh, override, you know, any, any situation you're in and say, I'm going to follow what the word said. And the word tells me in 1 John 1 and 9, uh, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That's a, that's a, that's a right. That's, that's an ability. That's a privilege. That's an authority only given to God's believers. So you have to know the first thing. You write that word down. 
exousia. I have exousia. But then there's other types of authority because other situations call for other types of authority. Um, I wasn't going to do this, but let's go to Ephesians 6 10. Ephesians 6 and 10. There is in Ephesians 6 10, I want you to see it. So that'll give me time to find it while you find it. But in Ephesians 6 10, there is an understanding of that. Another word for power in Ephesians 6 10. Uh, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, many of you know we're now talking about spiritual warfare. So you're right. I have the authority to be over the devil, but there's another word. It's just not authority. It's I have the force, uh, the not just the force, the, the might um, to, that's what that word power means. It's the Greek word kraktos. Write it down. I have this kraktos power also. So after I exercise my authority, the enemy may not move. So now I have to use my kraktos power. i got to believe, wait a minute. You know, that, 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 I'm getting angry stuff. Like, what you talking about? How are you messing with me when I know who I am, whose I am, and I know what I can do? That's when you start using that crack toast power. Somebody sitting there right now, you ought to get on crack. Just kidding. But you need to learn that crack toast means every now and then you got to stop being wimpy and whiny and, and thinking all about how stuff's not going to work. I'm talking to somebody. Stop walking around thinking. You got to know you have that power. And then you got to speak that word. Look at the look at the exhaustive language Paul is using. He said, look, after you've done everything else, after you've done all you can do, he said, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So that's his crack toast power. God said, that's that force. If you hang in there with me, I can knock stuff out the way. I can move any obstacle. I can do a miracle. All a miracle means is I will bend what's natural and make it bend to the supernatural. I will do what I need to do. Remember the, the wedding at Cana of Galilee? How Jesus took water, come on, and he made the water turn into wine. And we're not just talking about any old wine. He went from, you know, Tagaro, Tagaro's not wine. You can tell I don't, I don't drink wine. He went from the cheap wine, man, y'all, 2020, there you go. Oh, that's old, dig myself. He went from cheap wine to a Chablis. He said, look, I'm making it because everybody said, you took the best and saved it for last. No, he didn't. He did a supernatural miracle. But in your life, God will always do that with you. He can turn around at your worst situation and give you the best blessing when it looked like it's over. He saves the best he can do for last, but he only saves it. He only uses that crackdose power when it comes to believers who believe, not only do I have the authority, exousia, which is the right, I also have the crackdose, that force and that power. But there is one more type of power that we're going to need. So say something is not moving. Stay in Ephesians and go to chapter 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. We'll look at verse 19. Ephesians chapter 1. Make sure I got the right. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. Ephesians chapter 1. I was going to say that's not coming out right. Okay. You know, I was very, very good at turning my Bible, uh, but this, this phone stuff is pretty cool. All right, so look at verse 19. And we're starting in the middle of a conjunction, a conjunction but it, you'll understand. If you want to read the verses above, you can, but this will make my point. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at the right hand, his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in the world, but in that which is to come. Look at what the verse 19 says. What is the exceeding greatness of his power? And then we move down according to his mighty power. That word is dunamis. Dunamis power. 
So we got exousia, our authority. We got kraktos, our force. We, we got some force. But then when that's not working, we got that exceeding great power. Dunamis uh, in its form is where we get the word dynamite. It, 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 I'm trying to relate to you what kind of power this is. This is the power that is exceedingly above. You know how dynamite can blow through something and dynamite don't care what the structure is? This is the kind of power you're using now. I don't even have to think about how bad my situation is. I don't even have to think about how long I've been in my situation. I don't have to think about what it's going to take to move the situation. All I got to do is know, as Ephesians says, there is an exceeding greatness in God's power. There is a level of power where I just execute the dynamite. I just blow stuff out of my way. I just keep on trucking. All I'm saying is, you've used all, all these forms of power before. You know, the Greek language is so much more enhanced than our language, meaning that it gives you a clarity about what words you are speaking. And all I'm saying is, God gave us all these words for power because His power is so complete that we must know you have the power. In somewhere in your situation I'm talking about today, you either had to use your exousia, you had to use your authority, you had to use your kraktos, which is a force, or you had to use your dunamis, which is the dynamite of God, to blow stuff up. You got to know that the power of God has been given to you in your body. So how do we know this power is going to work? You need to write this down. God is the ultimate source of the power. God who? God the Holy Spirit. You say, well, you talking about God the Father. You talking about Jesus Christ. They're one. But God the Holy Spirit is the one executing for us now because he was left here to be that spirit of us. Do you know why sometimes we can discern between what the enemy is saying, which looks very true, which feels very true, which appeals to our senses, which makes us think it's there. Sometimes we look at that, what the enemy has done, and the only way we don't fall for it it's because of the Holy Spirit convicting us with a spirit of truth. He wakes us up and says, that's not the truth. And somehow you will escape a situation. Um, uh, someone just called the other day. You know there's a lot of scams out there, right? Someone called, and they, uh, they called my phone. I saw a number go. What the number? I didn't, I didn't recognize the number. I gotta let somebody know. I don't pick up numbers I don't recognize when they when I know there's numbers out of the area code, when I know the sphere of my business, right? So I feel if it's something real important, they'll leave a message, right? So I don't have time. I'm not gonna pick up all those calls. But anyway, I looked at it, I ignored it. Next thing I know, my wife called all upset, said, honey, there's somebody saying that um, that you owe some money, that uh, they have a I saw a warrant for you, the way she was saying it. They said they're going to come and pick you up if you don't respond to them by today. I said, okay, okay. I said, first come down. Um, I know who we owe and who we don't owe. And I can't think of anybody that's got any kind of legal action. I said, well, give me the number. So she texted me the number. Same number I ignored. That was my first cue. Then I called the person. And what the Holy Spirit will do, sometimes God wants you just to be quiet and be still. And he'll, he'll let you know the error. Sometimes we move too fast. We've gotten duped, we've gotten doped, we've gotten tricked uh, because sometimes we need to listen and let that Holy Spirit share with us a direction. So I figured I'm going to let these folk talk themselves into a hole until I get some clarity on what they're saying. So the woman started, and so I answered the phone, I threw her off, I said, uh, yes, because this is James Duncans, this is Reverend James Duncans, because I didn't know what the call was about. And she said, oh, 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 it, flubbed, it kind of got all flustered when I said, oh, uh, yeah, this is Reverend Dr. James Duncan. Oh, Reverend. Uh, well, uh, then she tried to go back to the standard spiel. You know, uh, this, uh, this call uh, may be recorded for purposes of training. And she couldn't even say it right. So I'm listening. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit saying, mm, nah, nah, scam, scam. So I said, ma'am, well, who are you? Uh, and what is this call pertaining to? She said, let me transfer you over to your account holder. I said, oh, oh I don't have an account. You haven't told me who this is yet. How are you going to tell me I got an account and I don't know who it is? Oh, they'll explain it. So she transferred it to the other person. I guess she told that person it's a reverend on the phone. So she, it, she was stuttering. You could tell they had no script, but it wasn't working. Because she said to me, um, well, there is a conglomerate that has 
eight companies that they represent, and one of them is a loan company that you borrow money from, and they send it over to us. From, so I let her talk. I wasn't saying nothing. It got quiet, and she talked herself out. And I said, okay, so who are you? Where are you calling from? She didn't tell me. I said, who am I supposed to have borrowed money from? Well, it's one of those eight companies. I said, you don't know which one and you're collecting it? She said to me, um, and I said, well, how much money was it? Well, we don't know what you did with the money. I said, no, I didn't ask you that. How much? Anyway, it got so ridiculous that I said to her, ma'am, you won't give me enough information. And what she said, this is what I knew. It was really crazy. She said to me, um, all I need is some, some of your personal information to clear this up. I said, you know what? Goodbye. She said, you want to go to court? I said, take me. Do you realize, after I got off the phone, I Googled the number. It was already a number that was a scam number. But they're so convincing, trying to, here's how they convince you. If you fall for the fear of, well, you're going to go to court, you're going to go to jail, you're going to pick you up. That's what the devil does, the same thing. He tells you, if you don't believe what I'm saying, if you don't work in the way I'm working, that nothing's going to work out. You're going to go blind. Uh, you, you're going to end up in the hospital. You end up in the grave. The devil will lie to you until you have that conviction from the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth. So how do I get that conviction? All power is already in God. Say that with me. All power comes from God. God, the Holy Spirit. If you go to 1 Chronicles 29, 11 through 12, it, it declares, 1 Chronicles 29, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength. Man, read those verses for yourself. That is such a declarative text about the foundational power that we base our deliverance on. That, that God is that source of power. It is so interesting because I found myself weak, and I know you have, and not knowing how I was going to survive. And all of a sudden, I remember I don't have to try to survive on my own. I have power, and my power comes from God. One of my favorite verses, I don't want you just to recite it. I want you to look at the context when you go back and look at what's surrounding these verses. You know, Israel's in exile, and Isaiah, this is Isaiah 40. Isaiah's trying to teach them to wait on God and hold on. Sometimes, in order for us to get to our power, we got to wait. Amen. I know I just touched somebody. Somebody, part of your problem is you can't wait. Um, it's Luke chapter 18. I don't know the verse. I think it's one. It says, in patience, you possess your souls. I did a whole biblical study for about a five-week Bible study just on the power of patience. You would save yourself so much anxiety. Just go back and look through our, our, our SBC Praise Church, and you'll see the Bible study on patience. You will find yourself able to walk through the day. You won't find yourself grabbing anxious thoughts because patience is a power all in itself. And the devil hates it when you can patiently wait on God. I'm giving a word to somebody. All you need today is some patience. Your situation is going to get clear. Look at Isaiah 40, 29, 31. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increased their strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. Those words are so symbolic of mirroring our Christian life. Sometimes I got to be able to run through some situations and I got to have the strength to make sure I do it. I got to be able to live. The word walk is a lot of times synonymous with living. And it's talking about you'll be able to walk through situations and not faint, not pass out, not give up because you know that God is blessed. Um, Psalm 68 says, you are God. You, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. God gives of Israel. God of Israel gives power to his people.
people. So the first step of you owning and believing this power from God, the Holy Spirit, is Romans 1.16, is just understanding that the gospel of God is, gives me, when I believe the good news, right, it's the power of God unto salvation. Now watch this. So let me read verse Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, of the good news. Jesus came down. Jesus died on the cross, went down to hell, snatched the keys from death, hell, and the grave, rose again, all power in his hands, left the Holy Spirit for us, sitting in heaven. Now we got his name. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it, my believing it, is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and the Gentile. God's power, understanding you have the power through the gospel, even gives you the ability to have salvation. It takes power to be saved. Not power that you generate, it takes the power of the gospel message, the power of the good news. What am I saying? You would not even get on your knees and pray if you didn't believe you were praying to somebody. Sometimes in order for you to attack a circumstance down here, you have to believe that God has already delivered or de delivered us from that circumstance by defeating that circumstance. Are you with me? So if I know Jesus defeated it, then when I speak for it, I don't have to speak, you know, like, like, it's not mine. I speak from a place that I believe in. And just believing it is the power. Believing. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That's how I live. I, I'm, I'm a believer. I, the world can do what it wants. Fall apart. I'm still going to live by what the word of God says. So when I look at the power of God or the power of the gospel to help me believe, that means that even salvation gives me a power that can't be refuted. What else does power do? God's power, God the Holy Spirit, here's a good one. Most of the time, your strength is going to come in your inner man and not in your outer man. Now watch me, guys. We are in this dual citizenship situation, right? We live on earth. But in reality, we are living in, we are citizens of heaven. Once we receive Jesus Christ, we are citizens of heaven. We now on this earth really are just ambassadors of God. Um, there's a whole series that Dr. Tony Evans does on this to clarify. So you understand uh, why you don't allow your flesh or your outer man to dictate because that's really not that's not who you are. You're a citizen of heaven. You're just an ambassador living in this far land. But while you're here, you bring a little bit of the authority of God. Wherever we walk, we bring that authority of the kingdom of God with us while we're walking. So when I say, when the Bible says, uh, where two or three are touching together in my name, there I am. All I got to do is find another believer. We can exercise heavenly principles even down here on earth. But... I said that to let you know it's not done in my outward man. I got to bring my flesh under subjection. It's done through my inner man. Are you with me? Ephesians 3. I'm going to read verses 16 to 20. I want you to write this down because this, this, this is a game changer right here for you, for somebody. It starts out in Ephesians 3, verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Oh, so uh, exhaustive, so innumerable. You can't even say anything, that words that would describe God's glory. To be strengthened, watch this, with might, by his spirit, in your inner man. Okay, so that part of me that was touched by God, that part of me in my soul that was regenerated and was born again, my inner man, the one that's learning the word of God, the one that's controlling my flesh, when I read the word, it's my inner man that God strengthens to be able to handle what's going on. Now watch the rest of this text. 
that Christ may dwell in your hearts by sight, by everything being all right, uh, by me never having a problem, by it never hurt. No, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, height, and to know the love of Christ. It is in that love that we possess. It, it, God's love for us is his, it, it's, it's just such a divine, we have to walk around and think divine and think love. But the kind of love that God has for us, it, I, the word unconditional doesn't even really speak to what God said. That's why Paul had to write that we would know the breadth and length and the depth and the height. And we would understand how God's love covers us from left, I mean, from right, or from east to west, from left to right, from top to bottom, that, that we would understand how much love God had. And it says what I just said a moment ago, which passive knowledge that you could be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask to think. Here's that word again. According to the power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages the world without him. God is saying that power has, my power has to be working in you for you to get the blessing that you desire. So that means that our inner man is being blessed. Um, 2 Corinthians 4.16 picks up this same thought. We do not lose heart. We do not faint. Because even though our outward man may be wasting away, our inward man is being renewed day by day. How does someone stay a believer in an unfair situation um, where they have to wait and believe that God's going to rectify it and not lose heart? Sometimes, man, we act like we're losing our minds when something unfair happens to us. Like we think we live in, in heaven. You're living amongst evil. We're, we're, we're trying to survive down here. This is war. This is a war zone. This, this is territory for us to fight. What you have to understand is God is saying that our, our inner man is being renewed day by day. And the outer man still may be fearful. Trembling, don't know what's going on, but we got to keep renewing that inner man because that's where our real power comes from. What am I saying? So in order for me to hold on, you know, I got an illness and doctors are done and we don't know what's going on. I have to read word every day. I got to renew my mind. I got to continue putting God in there. I got to keep praising God. I keep worshiping God. I keep believing it's God. And when I do that, it says my inward man gets stronger. And when my inward man gets stronger, here's the rub. The devil can't stand somebody who keeps standing. He can't stand you if you stand. If that makes any sense. He can't stand the fact that what he did did not make you run and curse somebody out, tell somebody off, and most of all, go hide in the corner in a little ball. I can't take this. And he said, no, strengthen your inner man. And I will do exceeding abundantly. Have I got a witness? Above what you ask to think. Because you, usually we're trying to reach that point that God's uh, power stops at. And where we think God's power stops. And where we think God's power stopping is really the first place. It's just beginning where we think it's the ending. God has so much more power. And I want to close with this. If you're going to access your power, you got to also understand that one of your greatest abilities and greatest ways to access, access God's power, access God's power, is by being a servant. That's right, I said it. You notice, if you're the kind of person that wants God to do everything, sometimes you don't want to be a servant, you want to be served. And you think this one-way relationship with God is just give me, oh, don't you turn me off. I'm almost done. Some of you don't like this one, but I'm letting you know that you can't access power always wanting and never wanting to give, never wanting to serve, never wanting to get to the point that you're serving a purpose. 
You know, I was teaching this one time, and somebody said, well, the woman with the issue of blood, she wasn't a servant. She just pushed through the crowd and got her healing. I said, but you missed the whole concept. She was serving. If you look at that time, who Jesus was and who people believed Jesus was, and the, I don't want to use the word politics, but the culture that understood, you know, the Jews were looking for the Messiah. Jesus was coming along trying to present himself as the Messiah. The Pharisees and the scribes and, and the Sadducees and all the other ones, they got angry because they had power making people jump through hoops in the law. So when Jesus was doing authentic miracles, they were being dismissed. So if you look at people who got healed in the Bible and you say they want to be in service, yeah, they were serving the purpose that we, we get the benefit of knowing she just touched his garment. She's our testament. Uh, she's our, the gift from God to say, see, if you keep pressing through one touch from me, she was serving God by allowing God's glory to be known, the, the healing, healing ability of God to be known. You serve God by telling people about God, by doing things for the kingdom, in the kingdom, through the kingdom. So then when you do that, God is glorified and power comes to you. That's the difference. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians got a lot to do. Uh, this book was written to, for us to understand the New Testament and the power of God. He said, Paul said in verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace giving me through the working of his power. You can only become a servant if your heart desires and when you do, he'll help you become a servant by the working of his power in your life. He'll, he'll uh, to give you an example, I know ushers that, that it was their Sunday to usher and they were tired, their feet were hurting and they said they're not going to go, but they got up and the whole time they dressed in and put on the uniforms and they were doing that. And you know what? They came on in and served God and they felt better once they got here. I know people singing on the choir. Got a headache that morning. Oh, I can't sing this morning. My head hurt. But they're getting dressed and they're pressing their way to sing. You know what happens? God's power heals them because of their service. It's people who serve God. Keep talking about God. Keep glorifying God. Keep letting people know what God is doing. That you get your power. I'm done today. We're going to pick this up next week. Uh, we're talking about, you got to spread this word. Let somebody know. We're talking about the fact that you have the power, right? Where it comes from, you have it. And how to access it. You got power. And so many believers, too many believers, don't use the power that is already theirs. And they don't know how to access it. So that's why we're talking about where the power comes from. God, the Holy Spirit. Now, um, I need you to, uh, you do me a favor. This ministry. Uh, please go online. We're in the middle of doing some, uh, redoing a part of our website. But if you go and look, I'd like you to consider uh, becoming, you know, liking um, and on our YouTube channel, I'd like you to subscribe. On here, I'd like you to like our channel and, you know, support our channel and share these messages. That's another way you can serve. Who else do you know is going to benefit you don't know what's going on in somebody's house and what they're going through. But if you give them a message like this that is steeped in biblical theology on how power works, you'll be blessing their lives. And subsequently, God blesses you. Now, I did not do that quid pro quo thing that you do this for God, he do this for you. No, it's contagious. It's, it's all good. The reason why that don't work is because it's conditional upon your heart. If you're doing something just to get something, I guarantee you it's not going to but when you do it because of the love of God, because of your love of your fellow uh, brother and sister, because you want God to be glorified, because you want this kingdom to grow, blessings can't help but follow because you tapped again into God's process on how to do it. I'd like you to help us build um, our Facebook um, up. We have several. If you go to our website, you'll find out when we're online virtually. And join it. I guarantee you the messages will bless you and bless your soul. And because you can access them at any time, I'm not telling you not to go to your church, but I'm just letting you know, here's another resource. If you want to go into 
SBC Praise Church, Shiloh Baptist Ministries. This is called our Word Up broadcast. I mean, the Word is the first thing you're going to see when you come to Shiloh. Not a personality. You know, I don't want nobody to kiss my ring. I'm not trying to be a superstar. But I want God's Word to be first in your life. This is Pastor Duncan saying God bless you. And I will see you again, hopefully, next week.